Paul, the latest theories in fundamental physics and cosmology are such that some scientists are now looking to so-called anthropic answers mm -hmm. to really eliminate the possibility that we can solve problems because of the uh, incredible diversity of possibilities. Uh, how do we look at the achievements of physics and cosmology uh, and the prospects for the future? Does this, this put a limit on what science can do? Well, Robert, I have a strongly held point of view on this issue. Uh, I think that this um, evolution of scientific thinking towards the anthropic principle is a, is a kind of failure, a sign of failure of a certain line of reasoning. Uh, we began 25 years ago with two very powerful ideas, or potentially powerful ideas, that were supposed to have a lot of explanatory power. One was inflation, that was supposed to uh, explain the large-scale structure of the universe by having a period of very early uh, rapid expansion in the universe, it was supposed to explain why it's so flat and smooth and why the slight deviations from smoothness are the way they are. We had a second powerful idea, string theory, that was supposed to explain in a powerful and unique way why the microphysical laws of physics are the way they are. And the two were supposed to come together to be this ultimate powerful predictive theory. And what's happened is we followed each of these theories down the road 25 years, the last 25 years, is they've each broken down in different ways. We discovered that inflation does make parts of the universe smooth, but it also makes many parts rough and different than what we observe. Yeah. In fact, it produces infinitely many of each type. So we thought we had a predictive theory, but we don't. Similarly, with string theory, we thought it was going to give us a unique picture of the fundamental forces of nature and how they unify. And at the moment, there's this idea that, no, 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 there's a landscape of possibilities. Each, and think, if you think by a landscape, I mean if you think of some complicated landscape with valleys, each val think of each valley representing new laws of physics. There are all these possibilities, this plethora of possibilities for the laws of physics. So it too broke down. So why are the laws of physics, and why is the universe the way it is now? Well, there's two possibilities. One, these two ideas are correct, but the laws are unpredictable. They're random. Different parts of the universe are different than others. And we happen to be the way where we are with our laws just because, well, the anthropic principle. We're here, therefore we see it. And if we, that's the reason we see what we see is because we're, we're here to see it. That's right. And, 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 and the problem with that idea, among the many problems with that idea, is that it really gives you no predictive power. Uh, it tells you the universe is the way it is, because if it wasn't, you wouldn't be here, but it doesn't allow you to predict anything. And the power of science, in my view, is all about its ability to predict things that we don't yet know. So in my view, this is not a, 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 a conclusion to reach. This is a sign of failure of one or both of these founding ideas. Either inflation is wrong, or a string theory is wrong, or both is wrong. It could just be one. So for example, we've been pursuing an alternative idea where we're changing the cosmological story, but we're keeping with the string theory story. So the cosmological story is different in that we produce, we're thinking about having a universe which didn't have spring from nothingness from the beginning, did not have a uh, period of inflation, but instead goes through regular cycles of evolution that keeps the conditions in the universe always the same, including the physical laws. Now, if you had a landscape of possibilities in principle, like you do for string theory, it wouldn't allow all those possibilities. Most of those possibilities would not have the right conditions that they would allow cycling. So it kind of picks out through cosmology one of those places in the landscape, one set of physical laws over all the others. Is that it one that it picks out? Because there's most supposedly likely, yeah. 10 to the 500th of these different so-called vacua of different places in the, in the landscape. Well, so okay, so, in the, so this is where the cycling becomes very different from the inflationary idea. In the inflationary idea, the universe begin, all the important action in creating the structure of the universe occurs at very, very high energies. Mm. And then when the universe finally cools, it doesn't care where it is in the landscape, right. so you populate right. them all. Right. Cycling is a more delicate, low energy process. The universe never gets very hot, never gets very energetic. And in fact, if you begin in most valleys in this, almost all the valleys in this uh, landscape of possibilities, almost none of them would cycle. And of the ones that would cycle, some would grow in spatially much faster than the others. One of them would be picked out among the others. So it's a kind of cosmological selection rule. Yeah. Just because they have a landscape doesn't mean they're all equally likely. Sure. This is a way of 
pushing the likelihood so that one is overwhelmingly more likely. This makes the combination of a cyclic model and a string landscape, say, potentially highly predictive with lots of new predictions that we, as we put them together, that we will discover. As opposed to the first picture, which leaves you with anything's possible. Well, anything's possible and you call it failure, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's untrue. It could be that, I mean, you can't get, the, for the planetary motions, you can't come up with some, some perfect reason why the, the orbits are a certain distance. It's sort of, that's the way it is. Well, I would say it's scientifically neither true nor untrue. Neither true nor false. <laughs> that is to say, it's just ill-defined scientifically, because science only has meaning if you can test the ideas sure, experimentally. Right, right, right. And the problem with this anthropic line of reasoning uh, is that the part of the universe we see, which seems to be perfectly uniform, more uniform than it needs, for, by the way, for you or I to exist, flatter, smoother, mm -hmm. more special properties, this is just a minority or an infinitesimal minority of, of, of the possibilities in the universe, the most very highly unlikely possibility. So it leaves you in a position where you don't have any sort of global picture of what the fundamental laws of nature and no predictions, nothing, nothing new to say. Whereas the other picture, how should I say, I mean, if you put the two together, you're going to get predictions and they're either going to be right or wrong. And so you can either kill or, or, or it's definitely <laughs> or false survival. Killed. Or be killed. That's right. That's right. Didn't want to think about the alternative. Yeah. But at the end of the day, let's say that everything that you say works and it's internally consistent, it's provable, et cetera. But one can then again ask, how are the laws of physics so, so developed, some would say finely tuned, that it created the possibility of these cycles going on that uh, do all these wonderful things and integrate string theory to make the, this harmonious universe uh, uh, habitable for life and all of that? I mean, at the end of the day, there are some limits to science, no? We don't know. Uh, I would hope that we could keep pushing the questions back in, uh, it to more fundamental questions, and at each stage find new ways of testing where we are. Uh, I think my disappointment with the anthropic principle is it's one of the ways in which it's a failure mode is I can't think of a single test that would say that this idea is wrong, nor could I think of a single test that would say this idea is right. So it's outside the bounds of science. It's outside the bounds, beyond the bounds of what I would call scientific knowability. It's metaphysics. Yeah. And I don't I'm not interested in participating in that, that, that activity. And I have no reason to give up on the scientific approach. I think there, you know, the fact that we've, you know, just the last few years been able to develop a non-anthropic predictive alternative mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. suggests to me that this is not the end of the line for predictive scientific alternatives. And ours may not be the winner, but I have every reason to believe that with a little bit more thought and more clever people will think of better, more powerfully predictive ideas. But in principle, is there a limit? Is there a limit to which science can go so that beyond which the experimental or observational method will not be effective in answering some ultimate questions? The answer is, we, as far as I'm concerned, is we don't know. We've really only been at this, though, for 300 years. Yeah. So if you ask me after 300 years, do I think I've hit the limit? No, I don't believe I've hit the limit. So I just think that we've gotten a little bit frustrated. We took a, you know, maybe a wrong turn one place or another, and we ended up someplace with, you know, outside the bounds of science. Uh, and if you want to follow that path, go ahead. But I suggest backing up and taking and trying out new paths and seeing if we can return to a scientific, um, uh, truly scientific and powerful way of thinking about the universe. And it's, Critical not just for this issue of cosmology and you know the universe itself. It's it has to do with the ultimate limits of what is knowable, uh, and you know uh, I just don't think we have the evidence to say at this point that we've reached that limit. The question is not whether we're at this moment reaching mm -hmm. the limit, but the question is I don't think anybody would say that. Yeah. But is it in principle? Is there in principle a limit to science? on these kinds of questions? Well, first of all, I think you're not correct that, we're, that people would say we're not at that time now. Uh, I think some of the proponents of the anthropic principle might argue uh, there's no point anymore in really measuring carefully the properties of the fundamental laws of physics because, after all, you're only learning something about your local neighborhood. Mm -hmm. You're not learning anything mm -hmm. about universal laws mm -hmm. of nature anymore. You're just learning about this patch, the <laughs> patch you happen to live in. Who cares about that? Um, so I think not everyone would agree that, uh, okay. th that this isn't the end of the line. 
But does the question reside within science itself whether science has a limit? Well, I'm a very pragmatic scientist. <laughs> so I, th I think I would say, in a sense, it does. That is to say, when it fails to make progress over a long period of time, at least as far as we humans are concerned, as far as we humans are able to, to uh, deal with the laws of nature, we, we personally have reached a limit. <laughs> Whether that means science has reached a limit, that a, more, a better, smarter, more evolved species wouldn't have done better, uh, I can't say.